Good afternoon, and welcome to the Wednesday, February 10th, COVID-19 response media briefing. I'm Frangie Mays, your facilitator for this event. I'd like to welcome our panel for today from the Washington State Department of Health. We have Dr. Umer A. Shaw, Secretary of Health, Michelle Roberts, Acting Assistant Secretary, Lacey Fahrenbach, Deputy Secretary for the COVID-19 response, Paj Nandi, Director of Community Relations and Equity, and Dr. Scott Lindquist, State Epidemiologist for Communicable Diseases. To begin today's briefing, we'll open with remarks from Secretary Shaw. Uh, Franchi, thank you. I am um, um, not able to op start my video. Saying the host has oh. to open. Oh, hold on for just a moment. Bear with us just one moment. And try now, Dr. Shaw. Um, hmm. It is not letting me show the camera, but I can still do, uh, let me, let me at least start my remarks and then I can come back with the video afterwards if that's okay. All right, and we'll continue to work on that issue on, on our end as well. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Great, no worries. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. As Frangie just uh, mentioned, my name is uh, Umer Shah, and I'm the health secretary for the Department of Health in the state of Washington. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. I um, have uh, gotten back to the western side of Washington, I'll say that this week I've been visiting eastern Washington and really have had the opportunity to meet with local health jurisdictions, partners on the ground, community leaders, and all sorts of other folks that are just leading the efforts on the ground with COVID-19. There's just an incredible amount of great work that's happening uh, throughout the state of Washington, both with respect to COVID-19 response and in public health broadly. And I wanted to make sure that I I uh, visited Eastern Washington and various communities across Eastern Washington because I did want to recognize the, the work that happens across the entirety of the state and also to remind everybody that uh, when I first came into this position, I had made the comment that I was not the Secretary of Health of just one part of Washington, but for all of Washington. And so that was really one of the key reasons why I went to various communities across this great state of ours. I did also have the chance to tour the state mass vaccination sites in Spokane and Kennewick. Each of these sites are making a big impact already in just over a couple of weeks of operation. As of Tuesday, for example, our Spokane site has administered more than 7,300 doses of vaccine and the Kennewick site has administered more than 7,800. I was one of the, the vaccinators for, uh, for at least one person on the ground. And I do wanna say that the work that is being done on the ground with our, our private partners, our public partners, uh, our, our guard, uh, with uh, the National Guard, we've had just an incredible amount of, of just work uh, that's, being, that's being done on the ground. And I also want to just recognize the Department of Health folks who are just working so hard every day. It is so encouraging to see these vaccination sites getting shots into the arms of people, not just at these large throughput sites, but also in community clinics and in pharmacies and other places throughout our system. Uh, we could not do it without all of our partners. Uh, these efforts are absolutely reflecting the progress we continue to see in our statewide vaccination data. And as you have been continuing to watch, uh, we have set our goal of giving 45,000 vaccinations per day. Our current seven day average is almost 27,000 doses given each day and we're continuing to see improvement. But at the same time, we uh, have built the capacity 
And this is with the support of Governor Inslee and his team so that we can give markedly more vaccines if we had the vaccine supply. As you know, uh, this past week, we had requests for 358,000 uh, first dose vaccines across the state, and we only received uh, approximately 110,000 vaccines from our federal partners. Very soon, our providers in the state will have administered 1 million doses of vaccine. This is such an exciting milestone. I'm also so thankful again to all of our partners on the ground, including uh, in the, the various healthcare systems who are working so closely with all of us to make sure that we can continue to vaccinate as quickly as possible. I also wanna recognize our VAX Center, the Vaccine Action Command and Control System Center, VACCS. Uh, this is the public-private partnership uh, that we have put together, led by Dan Laster, uh, who have really brought together the, the, the real energy of the private sector and coming together to really support state efforts in vaccination. Uh, and, and I just want to say thank you to all of our private partners. More information and details on this effort are gonna be coming very soon, probably next week, as we continue to, to talk through all the different um, activities that the VAC Center is, is really um, uh, working on right now with various work streams. While we celebrate the successes we've had so far, we also recognize there's a lot of work still needed to reach our goals of vaccinating people in our state as quickly as possible, but we also know we wanna do the, this in an equitable manner. And so later today, we are releasing a report on our analysis of vaccination data by race and ethnicity, as well as age. These data are absolutely critical to understand how we need to adjust our vaccine distribution to address health inequities and related access barriers throughout the state. Unfortunately, though, we have prioritized high risk and those populations more at risk or more vulnerable in our vaccine allocation, the report will show that we have significant work to do. And in fact, we have inequities in vaccinations for our Hispanic populations, uh, our black populations and multi-racial populations in the state of Washington. Here are some of the findings included in that report. 4.7% of people who have received at least one dose of vaccine and 5.9% of people who are fully vaccinated are Hispanic. That's lower than the Hispanic representation in the state population, which is 13.2%. Black and multiracial people are also underrepresented among vaccinated people compared to the overall state population. This is true both amongst people who have received at least one dose of vaccine and people who are fully vaccinated. Again, the data show us that we need an even more intentional pro-equity approach. And just last week, as you all know, we announced that we had launched the vaccine implementation collaboratives across the state of Washington. And this is really an opportunity for us to get feedback and have dialogue with community stakeholders with, a, with the lens of equity as central theme for the work that we're doing. In addition to the data report, we're also releasing a plan later this week for equitable COVID-19 vaccine access with strategies to reduce the inequities we are seeing. Some of those strategies are already underway and others are newly identified. You're going to hear more about the report and our plan uh, as we uh, release this information. I have Paj Nandi, uh, Department of Health's Director of Community Relations and Equity, in, uh, on this call as well, and he can answer some additional questions. We know that this equity challenge is one that is not just for the state of Washington, it's across the country. And I will say that we are absolutely committed to, as I mentioned earlier with the VAC Center, to increasing throughput and numbers and quantity and effectiveness of our vaccine efforts. Again, with the help of our private sector, while we also focus on and remain focused on our equity concerns um, that are also a part of the work that we are doing. We're committed to taking immediate action to improve our vaccine distribution efforts from a, an equity perspective and ensuring equitable and culturally responsive access, particularly for communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 in the state of Washington. And we will continue to make this a top priority moving forward. I, I wanna just uh, pause for a moment and say that some, some across the country have said that if you, if you try to increase the numbers, uh, you lose the ability to address equity. 
I would challenge all of us to see both of these efforts as complementary and not necessarily at tension with each other. I think it's not an either or, it is an and. So let me move to our um, vaccine efforts that are on the ground. And I wanna again, thank all of our partners on the ground uh, who are doing this crucial work of people of helping people get vaccinated. Again, I was able to see this in some of the, the tribal clinics. I've been able to see this in, in uh, the community health centers, local health departments, and certainly our private sector, including in our hospitals. Uh, everyone is on the front line and, and you know, the folks that are, that are doing this work on the front line uh, in communities uh, certainly are hearing from community members firsthand. And so we have, as you all know, phases and prioritization plans that we have uh, provided to everyone. They are there to help our provi providers answer the questions about who, when, and why. Our priority as a state is to get to the highest risk populations first. And as you know, that we started off with healthcare workers and first responders and, and continuing work with long-term care facilities. We're also now in um, the um, older population above the age of 65 or multi-generational households above the age of 50. If counties make it through their allocated doses early, and that means in the current phase of 1B1, uh, we certainly want them to contact us at Department of Health, um, and we will work with them to reallocate those doses across the state. We want to get people in phase 1B1, um, sorry, phase 1B1 vaccinated faster and as quickly as possible throughout the state of Washington. We do not want to have counties moving to the next phases earlier than others. We still have a lot of work to do statewide to get to our higher risk populations as fast as we can before we move into other tiers of, of phase 1B. But there is so much demand that remains, as all of you know, in phase 1B1 still. We needed to catch everyone up before we have what we call early movers ready to advance to the next phase in counties out of alignment with the rest of the state. So we are very much focusing on this, and this is something that we have been communicating with our providers on the ground, and we are going to continue to reiterate the point that we are all in this together. In addition to these vaccine updates, I would like to briefly mention some overall statewide trends. As of yesterday, our state has seen 307,867 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And unfortunately, we've also seen 4,558 deaths. Although we have recently been seeing some hopeful signs like declining transmission, our case counts and hospital admissions continue to be high. We must all continue to take precautions to slow the spread. And I'm hopeful that everybody this past weekend did everything they could uh, to, to take preventive precautions with Super Bowl activities. However, if you, and this is to our community members, members, if you gathered with people outside your household for the Super Bowl this past weekend, we want you to keep an eye out for symptoms. If you think you might be getting sick, if you might have symptoms, we want you absolutely to stay home. And if you do notice symptoms, we want you absolutely to get tested. Again, the line is, do not guess, don't guess, take the test. And of course, we should all keep up all of our efforts to practice the three W's of wearing a mask and washing our hands and watching our distance, but it's complementary to testing and it's also complementary to our efforts in vaccination. I know there's a lot more that I can say, but I wanna pause there and I will now turn it back over to Frangie and to my colleagues who are gonna talk about additional vaccination efforts, but also we are ready to have further conversations and dialogue related to equity concerns with vaccination and other efforts in our state. Frangie, thank you so much. And while, while I transition back to you, I'm gonna um, uh, quickly pause also to make sure that I can get my camera to be working. Thank you. Thank you, everybody's apologies. I had a momentary uh, technical difficulty there. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for your remarks. Um, next, we'll go to Michelle Roberts. 
Great. Thank you, Secretary Shaw. And I'm Michelle Roberts, and I lead the COVID-19 vaccine planning and distribution team for the Department of Health. I want to get, begin by updating you on the increasing vaccination numbers in our state. As of February 6th, more than 940,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been given out in Washington. Across the state, we've administered nearly 80% of the more than 1 million doses delivered to our providers in long-term care settings. After the past few weeks, we've sped up vaccine across um, all the settings. Right now, we're vaccinating nearly 27,000 people on an average day. Since um, opening January 26th, our four state mass-led um, our state-led mass vaccination sites have given out more than 30,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. I'm proud of the hard work of our team, our providers, and the public. Everybody's doing their part. And so now I wanna address one of the most common questions you've been asking, am I guaranteed a second dose? We know there has been a little confusion around second doses. Second doses should be administered like this. For the Pfizer vaccine, the second dose should be given three weeks or 21 days after the first dose. For the Moderna vaccine, the second dose should be given one month or 28 days after the first dose. We're committed to ensuring there is a second dose of COVID-19 vaccine for everyone who receives their first dose. We have asked our providers to prioritize vaccine series completion. This might mean using first dose supplies to vaccinate people who need second doses. To stay on track, providers should schedule second dose appointments when giving that first dose. People should make sure they're getting their second dose at the same place they got their first. Please remember to bring your record card back with you. It's important you receive the same vaccine each time. There is a process we'll be facing together over the coming weeks, so please be flexible as we navigate the waters. Together, we'll make sure people get the doses they need. Now I wanna talk a little bit about vaccine supply. We wish we could give everyone vaccines right now. In fact, my parents are still waiting to get their vaccines here in Washington state. But supply from the federal government continues to be our biggest challenge. This week, our providers requested more than 440,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. That's first and second dose requests. In all, we've, um, we received just over 200,000 doses, which is less than half of what our providers asked for. Although doses are not where we would like them to be right now, we are optimistic about the future. The federal government tells us that allocations for both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will increase in the coming weeks and months. And the progress of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also encouraging. Last Thursday, Johnson & jo Johnson, and Johnson announced they submitted an application to the FDA for emergency use authorization, also known as an EUA. This, um, the FDA could decide by the end of this month. And if, that, um, if the J&J &J vaccine can meet the FDA emergency use authorization, that means we would have a third vaccine to use in March. And on the allocation forecast, here's some more good news. For the first time, we received a three-week allocation forecast from the federal government. Up until last week, we only got that notice um, one week at a time, which made planning incredibly hard. This will help us develop a multi-week strategy to help with consistency and predictability, which will help for both the providers on the ground and all of the public who are looking for places to be vaccinated. We hope to have this plan fully in place in the coming weeks. And before wrapping up, I wanna talk about the winter weather heading our way. If the forecast is correct, we may see significant snowfall in our area as soon as tomorrow, and it may stay snowy throughout the weekend. Please do not put yourself and others in danger by driving in the snow and ice to get your COVID-19 vaccine. If the weather is bad, we may have to close some sites and reschedule appointments. Please remember, your health and safety is our number one priority. I wanna end by thanking the public for your patience. We know many of you want a vaccine and waiting is not easy, but we promise your turn is coming. Thank you. All right, thank you, Assistant Secretary Roberts. Um, this brings us to the Q&A segment of today's briefing. We have several reporters with questions today. If we're not able to get to your question, as always, please reach out to us at doh-pio at doh.wa.gov. Our first question comes from Ariel 
with the spokesman. Great, thank you. Uh, the Biden administration announced a couple weeks ago that they would be sending more vaccine doses directly to pharmacies in the coming weeks. I'm wondering if the Department of Health is aware of how this will affect our supplies and if the department has the ability to tell the federal government where to send those doses. Ariel, thank you. Um, I'll, Michelle, I'll say, uh, because I, I just saw Ariel uh, this past week in, in Spokane. So uh, great to hear your voice. And Ariel, thanks for that question. Um, uh, as uh, you may have heard with this, uh, this is a, a new uh, pharmacy program that the federal government is um, has, has launched. And as you have also heard that um, the, the states have, uh, while we have been made aware of the information and what's going to be happening, and uh, we've had some uh, limited amount of input, for the most part, this is a program that the federal government is working through with the chain pharmacy um, uh, stores. Um, um, and uh, so it, it brings up a couple of uh, comments. One is that it is a separate allocation of vaccine doses. It is not taking away from our vaccine doses and the, the, the hundred and some thousand that I referred to at the beginning. But at the same time, it also uh, underscores the point that we want to continue to advocate, which we have been, uh, by the way, with our federal partners that the, the states um, really should have involvement that's going to help us um, uh, define where those pharmacies are within states so we can really assure that they are equitably accessed or available throughout uh, communities across uh, the state of Washington. So that's in general what we're doing behind the scenes. Michelle, if you wanted to add some additional specifics to this program, because I know you've been, you've been in touch with uh, the, the, the federal partners about this program in specific. Yeah, I can just add a couple more points. So we just found out yesterday that the um, facilities that are participating in Washington right now for the federal program got 22,500 doses of vaccine. Um, and again, like Dr. Shaw said, that vaccine um, is a separate allocation from our state allocation. That vaccine went to 202 locations to three different pharmacy groups in our state, Safeway Albertsons, Costco and Health Mart independent pharmacies. So we did have a role in um, helping the federal government decide which pharmacy chains to start with. And so we helped pick the Safeway Albertsons, Costco and Health Mart. Um, and that is the initial rollout. And then if you've looked at the information on the federal um, website, there's many other um, pharmacy groups that will be eligible to get vaccine through the federal program as vaccine supplies increase. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Kelly with KATU. Go ahead, Kelly. Hi there, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, my question is also about the uh, vaccine rollout with uh, pharmacies and the federal uh, numbers that they're getting. I know you just told us how many they got um, how do you think that this will help in Washington state roll out vaccine even more? And do you expect other pharmacies, some notable major ones are like Walgreens and CVS, do you expect them to be signing on as well? Yeah, great question. Um, I do expect all the pharmacy chains who are eligible to participate in the federal program will participate. Like I said, it was um, the federal government limited the amount um, that are starting off in this initial start of the program just based on supply. So I think it's another way to increase access across our state. We know pharmacies that do have vaccine either from the federal program or they're getting vaccine from the state program um, are doing a great job in meeting the 95% requirement and using up all the vaccine they get in the seven day period. And we have really great reporting for pharmacies. So they're doing a good job. Um, and it's really important that it could be um, another spot for community access. So maybe um, in an underserved community or maybe just when anybody is out getting their grocery um, shopping, they can schedule their COVID vaccine appointment at the same time. 
So we think pharmacies are one of the types of providers that need to be part of the mix along with the healthcare system, employer-based clinics, mass vaccination, community pop-up clinics, and mobile vaccination clinics. So they're one of the important um, locations where vaccine needs to um, be to ensure communities have access. All right, our next question comes from Simone with Q13. Hi, thank you so much. I'm wondering what you would attribute to the huge disparity between how many Hispanics especially have been vaccinated versus the percentage of population and also just how disproportionately impacted they are by the virus as a whole. So why is it that their percentages are so much lower than other groups especially given the impact of COVID on this community. And uh, in addition to that, why are we just now hearing about this data that's gonna be released later today and um, a highlight on this issue? I think that throughout the pandemic, we knew that these communities are disproportionately impacted. So why are we hearing about this now in the middle of February? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for that, for that question. Um, you know, as, as you remember, uh, I'm also coming, uh, my, my previous um, uh, position was coming from a community that had a large Hispanic population. And I will tell you, as, as I've been uh, speaking with, and I know our Department of Health colleagues, um, my staff members that are here um, are speaking with um, their colleagues across uh, the country. Uh, this is, un unfortunately, this is uh, happening throughout the, the United States. And uh, there have been a lot of um, reasons that have been offered, not just um, for vaccines, but even for um, a, a number of things, right? Why, why do we have less testing in certain uh, communities? Why do we have um, uh, less communications in certain um, community or communities? Why, why is there uh, more mistrust in certain communities? And I think the answer is really um, a, a, a very complex uh, group of a number of answers. And so, yes, um, and when, you, when we're talking about our Hispanic community, we know that there are linguistic uh, issues, language issues. Uh, they, there may be um, issues around immigration. There may be issues of, about trust and, and mistrust uh, with um, sometimes with government or public sector. Uh, we also recognize that there, uh, there uh, may be a hesitation for the vaccines themselves. And we're hearing also that there is some information that's going out through various social media um, um, outlets that is providing information for, for certain populations to wait, to hesitate uh, before they actually get vaccinated. So it's really hard to pinpoint um, exactly where uh, we have some of these, um, um, what are the reasons? But I do want to say a couple of things. One is in terms of releasing this information uh, now, you know, we wanted to have enough information, enough um, a real look at what was happening in the, in the vaccine efforts. And, and I think you could even make a, a cogent argument that uh, right now, as we are starting with the, the 1A population, which was, as you know, healthcare workers and, and first responders, uh, which unfortunately um, is is also from a race ethnicity standpoint a, a population that that may be less diverse. Um, again, it, it doesn't excuse, but it, it does uh, potentially explain why you may have some differences in race ethnicity data across different groups. But in addition to that, it's also looking ahead that um, as we are now vaccinating in other populations by age and also eventually by sectors, by occupations, that we are um, going to need to continue our work in this area. So your, your question about why now, uh, you know, and frankly, um, we could also um, be waiting to get some more information about the 1v1 population before we release, but we felt it was important to get this information out, not just preliminary information, but also the information that we have right now. Now we know that we're gonna to continue to add to this information. We also recognize uh, that it uh, does have limitations, right? So some of the limitations very much are um, that uh, we have, uh, which I did not mention, but we have about 11% of the vaccine data 
uh, that uh, do not uh, indicate Uh, race, ethnicity. So we have some uh, some questions, and so we have to keep uh, um, across the country. You know, folks with disease is something that uh, people have to do with a cautionary uh, look. Uh, but again, we felt it was very important to get this information out. Now, um, I always think it's about the the what, but it's really about the the, the now what. It's it's what do we do with this information? And um, you know, I, I think that it's a combination of really. Um, continuing the efforts that we have had in place. I, I, I want to make sure it's clear that this is not just starting today. We have been working on this for months uh, on how to address these kinds of things uh, when it comes to race, uh, ethnicity, or inequities, even by um, um, urban areas, uh, rural areas, geographic areas, uh, smaller jurisdiction, larger jurisdictions. We want to take a, a markedly more diverse lens or set of lenses as we look at at um, equity information across the spectrum. Um, I think this might be a good time, Simone, as you ask that question for for me to invite Paj Anandi to make some comments. I think Paj can really describe uh, really some of the strategies that we're looking at with, with equitable vaccine distribution. And, and, and why it's so critical that we all work together. Because again, sometimes we are champions of messages where we have to rely on those trusted messengers within communities so we can get um, really more equitable vaccine distribution in those communities. Uh, Paj? Thank you, Dr. Shah. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Paj Nandi and I serve as the Director of Community Relations and Equity. And as Dr. Shah indicated, I think we, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, factors that are contributing to the initial inequities that we're seeing in our, in our data related to vaccine. And I, I will also add that in, in addition to some of the systemic inequities, including racism that are, that is baked into the structures of, of government, uh, we're also looking at um, factors such as low supply and, um, and also uh, looking at vaccine hesitancy. I think Dr. Shah mentioned that we know from even our community engagement efforts that BIPOC communities and other historically marginalized groups have uh, a lot of hesitancy um, and have a lot of distrust for, for, for very valid reasons. And at the same time, we also know uh, that we have solutions by working with community to actually address some of that vaccine hesitancy. Um, um, so I wanna quickly just kind of go over some of the strategies that we've been identifying. There is no one single strategy that's going to turn the course around inequities. These are long-standing inequities and our systems are basically designed to perpetuate the same status quo. So it does take a lot of resource and a lot of work to sort of work against that. And we've been actively working uh, to really, um, uh, to really uh, change that status quo to the best of our ability. Um, I wanna start out by saying that we first, one of our key strategies has always been to engage communities to inform vaccine prioritization and planning. And a, a strong example of that is we heard from BIPOC communities directly uh, that they shared the, and they shared the need to prioritize older adults and elders who are cared for at, at their own home. And this kind of feedback directly informed the inclusion of older adults in multi-generational homes in phase 1B tier one. We know that we need to continue to solicit community feedback as we move, uh, as we look at titrating. Uh, the other phases that are coming online soon, and also solicit community feedback for phases two and four, which again, are still uh, to be determined. We also need to integrate a more pro-equity approach in the way we uh, allocate vaccine and distribute vaccine. There are so many access barriers that we've been, he we've been hearing about from community leaders and partners over and over again, uh, including language access, uh, uh, technology access barriers, transportation barriers, et cetera. And we know that even within our max vac sites, we can integrate an equity lens, uh, for example, by starting to reserve appointments uh, for phone-based scheduling. Uh, I know we've been doing that in Clark County, I believe 20% of all appointments are now going to be phone-based. Uh, we also want to prioritize allocation to providers who effectively serve disproportionately impacted communities. And we have tools uh, that we've designed, uh, the COVID-19 Social Vulnerability Index Mapping Tool, which is unique to Washington State, uh, borrowed from CDC, that can help 
align vaccine allocation and coverage uh, that, uh, especially in areas with high social vulnerable, uh, vulnerability. Uh, we want to continue to invest in and actually increase our investment in trusted community messengers uh, and organizations. Uh, I think I shared that at the last um, report out that we have contracted and subcontracted with community-rooted, community-led organizations, and they are the ones that are best suited to support community-led vaccine outreach, um, especially for those that have been disproportionately impacted. A great example is that we have uh, one of our contractors right now, uh, Black Lens in Spokane, who is organizing a radio show to address vaccine hesitancy with the Black community by incorpor incorporating trusted leaders from that community. We also want to ensure that all our communications, education, outreach efforts are culturally and linguistically appropriate and accessible. So we want to make sure that it's it's a multi-modal uh, strategy, uh, that all information is available in our top 36 languages per our language access plan, uh, that we leverage community-based social media influencers, we uh, look at community-driven, culturally appropriate messaging, and that we also do in-language audience testing for any campaign messaging that's going out, because that is going to be really critical in addressing some of those hesitancy and, and, not, and not really also ascribing a monolithic approach to communities, knowing that when we say the Latinx community, there is a lot of diversity within the Latinx community. And how do we uh, truly honor and respect that diversity and really seek input from community members that uh, really are part of that diaspora? And then um, some of the other strategies I'll quickly mention are strengthening the public health system uh, and their ability to center communities in vaccine outreach and access. This is really happening at the local level and our local health departments are working very hard along with vaccination partners to really uh, expand vaccination access. As uh, Michelle Roberts mentioned earlier, we just don't have enough supply, but when as supply increases, how do we create structures and systems that allow community-based sites to be more accessible and, and available? So we've been working uh, internally to create community-specific outreach and engagement plans we uh, plan to share them uh, with our vaccine implementation collaborative partners uh, next week as well, and just continue that ongoing dialogue to see uh, what is really working for the state of Washington and how can we better inform our efforts so that they are trauma-informed, they are community-driven, community-led, and so that we can truly honor community who are more closest, who are closest to the solutions than just relying on uh, state, uh, state planning and, and sort of best faith effort. So I'll pause there. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Keith at Como. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Um, are you hopeful that uh, with the improving numbers that the regions, uh, more regions are gonna be able to move to phase two, you announced it on Friday. And uh, are we seeing a decline in cases because we're also seeing a decline in testing as there are cause and effect relationship there? And are you worried about a possible fourth wave with the variants? Yeah, th thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is a, a number of um, the, the questions I was receiving on the ground uh, this week uh, from partners um, in, in the communities that I visited. This was a, a, a really important question, set of questions for them, which was about the roadmap to recovery, uh, where, you know, where are our regions and how do we move forward? Uh, what are the numbers and what are we what are we seeing? And um, I want to invite uh, uh, Dr. Lindquist in on this as well. Let me just make a couple of quick comments and then Scott can provide some additional details. Um, you know, there, the, the, the real reason that all of us are so focused on vaccines and vaccinations is because it is a race against time. And we are concerned about um, a, a number of factors. One, we're concerned about COVID fatigue and people saying, look, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a year and I, I'm just tired of wearing a mask or, or um, you know, all the three W's. Uh, we're also concerned as we're seeing on the ground that people as they're focusing on vaccines, uh, they are also thinking that uh, they do not need to get tested. And in fact, just yesterday in Spokane, um, well, while there was uh, the mass vaccination set up, there was also testing that was happening at the Spokane Arena. I had an opportunity to talk to a few people and uh, one of the um, the um, uh, younger people that I, I spoke with, uh, a younger woman who said that uh, she was very, uh, very much concerned that she, you know, may have been exposed and she wanted to, 
to make sure that she got tested. But she also indicated in that same breath that there are others in her age group that that are dismissive of that. They don't think that they need to get tested. And then the others are confused because they think that vaccines uh, means that vaccinations means that you do not need to uh, wear your mask, watch your distance, wash your hands, and certainly that you do not need to uh, get tested. And so we have to really fight this misinformation. It's absolutely critical. And then certainly that feeds into with um, uh, or leads into both um, the concern for increases in cases, right? Post Super Bowl, where we are concerned in public health across the country that two, three weeks later, we're going to see an increase. Uh, we're also concerned about the fact that we have variants now uh, in the United States, and we have to really be mindful of what that's going to look like. And that that really leads to to your question about the fourth fourth wave. Uh, you know, we're we're still in the midst of trying to get off this third wave here. And our goal is to, to really come, uh, come down from this in a way that not just drives these numbers down, but drives them significantly down so we can all be assured that while we continue our efforts to vaccinate, uh, that we are also approaching the best uh, lens that we can for uh, avoiding a fourth surge. Um, there, there are a lot of uh, discussions happening across the country whether we are going to see one, um, but right now it's, it's just speculation at this point. Uh, Scott, did you want to add a, a few things to this? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, it's a great question. We are seeing a decrease in our case counts. We're seeing a decrease in our percent positivity, decrease in our hospitalizations, and a decrease in the percentage in our intensive care units. So all together, um, those are trends that are hard to ignore. None of us have seen the, the generations of the data for this week. That'll be uh, done and presented on Friday. So um, we hope there will be some improvement where other counties or regions are moving to phase two. Um, there is some decrease in the amount of testing being done, but given with those other four indicators I talked to earlier, we are seeing improvement and that that is the hope. Um, just a reminder about the variants. We are really ramping up our ability to uh, do surveillance on the isolate. So when we get a positive test and then we genotype those, um, the goal is to be doing about 5%. We are one of the states that is doing a very high level of genotyping to look for these variants. And following those variants to see what percentage of isolates are actually um, variants of interest compared with the data that I just talked about, that's going to give us our best sense of whether we're going to have a fourth wave. But as Dr. Shaw said earlier, we are coming down the backside of the third wave right now. And we hand that back to you, Frangie. All right. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Sandy with the Seattle Times. Thank you so much. Um, for, for Michelle Roberts, you, you mentioned that um, you've asked vaccine providers in some cases to use first doses for second doses. How, how prevalent has that been and, and wh what kind of impacts are you seeing from that? I think, there we go, now I'm unmuted. Um, we're trying to correct what we think was some confusion several weeks ago um, when we rolled out the 95% requirement around how would that apply to the second dose. And we did see some providers, um, and it just is hard at the provider level to manage you know, multiple pots of inventory, but where first doses were used for second doses. Um, or sorry, um, second doses were used for first doses um, several weeks ago. And so that's created quite a demand right now on making sure we have enough second doses to meet those first doses that were given several weeks ago. So we're working to, um, to, to figure that out. Um, you'll see, I think we, we put some information out last night on social media that was really showing that um, we have an incredible amount of requests for doses this coming week. Um, around 180,000, and that's almost our entire allocation. So we're working to understand the scope of the problem 
and then identify a couple different options about how we can do um, how we can manage that. And these first and second doses line back up for the future. So that will make sure providers are asking for the vaccine they need over the next seven, seven days for the um, um, right amount of second doses appointments that they have scheduled, and then um, ensuring um, that the rest of the vaccine is then for first doses. So we're still working on, on kind of the whole scope of the problem, but um, working directly with providers to ensure that they are scheduling second dose appointments when they're making first dose, because that's gonna allow them to, or help them give us accurate information on how many second dose appointments do they have each week and then making a plan for how can we um, kind of realign um, where the first and second dose needs and get that taken care of so that going forward, we could be back to how much vaccine uh, first and second doses can be used in a seven day period. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Sam with KEPR. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, my, my first one is just to uh, Dr. Shaw. I know he visited the Benton County Fairgrounds yesterday in Kennewick, and I just wanted to see what his initial thoughts about the operations down there were. And then also, I know we've talked a lot about there's more demand for the vaccine than currently available. And, and right now, the discussion with vaccine equity. Um, but, but is there any more information kind of about delivery for second dose vaccine at the mass vaccination sites with, with those deadlines coming up pretty quick for some of the people? Yeah, uh, let, let me, um, I'll give my impressions in just a moment. Uh, Michelle or Lacey, did you want to address that second dose uh, question about the, the, the vaccination sites? And then I'll, and then I'll come back. Yeah, we are, um, many of the, well, actually all of our um, mass vac sites will be transitioning to offering some second dose appointments next week. Um, actually, I should say maybe with the exception of the Spokane site, who's the one using Moderna vaccine, who would still have another week out. The other three vaccine, um, three sites are, have people who are ready for their second doses and those appointments have been scheduled and we will be doing both first and second dose appointments at the mass vac sites next week. Lacey, was there anything you wanted to add? Okay, not hearing. Um, so, um, yeah. So, thanks for that question. I, you know, I, uh, I really was impressed by the operation. Um, I uh, met uh, Chief uh, uh, Greer, I believe, uh, who was uh, the incident commander uh, on the ground. He was working. He's he's part of the, um, I believe. Um, Kennewick uh, fire. Um, and, uh, just, he's been through so many, uh, different emergencies, um, very experienced in the, in the work that he does. Uh, I met our department of health staff who were just doing a fantastic job of, of overseeing the operations and integrating in with what was happening, uh, alongside with, um, our, um, uh, national guard or, uh, state guard, um, uh, folks that were there, uh, you know, I'll tell you that uh, I was very impressed um, by how quickly they were processing people through uh, it. Um, you know, it really uh, is a, a an amazing operation when you when you see the number of lanes that are that are put in place. And I've now had a chance to visit three of the sites, and all three of those sites are very different. When you go down to the one in Clark County that we have, it it is inside um, a big uh, arena, if you will, and you drive through, and you kind of uh, you you kind of come in, and and your car comes in, and then people come almost like. Um, like um, like a pit stop at a at a race where they come out and then they vaccinate you and then you you're on your you pull back out and you're on your way. Whereas going to Spokane was people coming into an indoor arena and uh, they were saying that uh, from beginning ten it was a six minute process uh, before they get to the you know fifteen or thirty minute wait uh, period uh, area um, after the vaccination. So very very efficient operation. And then at Kennewick uh, it's a drive through where you, you know, you drive through and there are multiple lanes that are open, uh, open up and the, the vaccinators who included the paramedics as well as the, the state guard, they were just fantastic. And like I said, they, they, uh, let me, uh, give one vaccine myself and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I, um, uh, 
uh, it took me just a moment to get my gloves on. It's been a, it's been a while since I've given a vaccine, um, uh, license to do it and uh, able to do it. Absolutely. But it's been a while since I've, I've done that. And I just wanted to, to really recognize the incredible team efforts that are, that were put in place. Uh, what I, what I did make sure that I made known to the entire team though, was the importance, not just of numbers and people, but that we needed to make sure that it felt uh, welcoming and safe for all community members. Uh, as we just talked about race, ethnicity, day, Data, uh, also those who, who may be uh, mobility um, um, issues or challenges that might be in place. We wanted to make sure, or I wanted to make sure that I was uh, bringing that message to them that it was also not just about throughput, but it was about uh, assuring equity. And, and the good news is they were already thinking about better outreach efforts with the local health department. So uh, the Benton County Health um, Department, I had a chance to visit with them as well. And they were also at the site and they were talking about the outreach efforts to get people into the mass vaccination or high throughput clinic. So I was really impressed by the operation. I know uh, the, the biggest limitation we have right now is supply. And uh, that's true for those sites as well as elsewhere across the state. 358,000 vaccine requests and uh, for first, first doses and you have 110,000 to go around. The math doesn't work in our favor, but we know that the governor has had requested us to build the capacity. So once the vaccines were there, we could in a modular way increase uh, the, the, the numbers and we've got to do that, but we also have to do that in an equitable way. So again, overall impressive operation. I can't wait to go back. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jefferson with NCW Life. Hello, thank you. Um, here in Wenatchee, we have one of the four mass vaccination sites up and running. It's doing a lot of business. It's been very well received. On Monday, our local health authorities in our health district sent out the notice, hey, we have vaccination appointments available. Please sign up, go on PrepMod and make yours. And a lot of people took this as an invitation to jump the line, to uh, enroll for vaccinations, even though they might not be in one of the qualifying tiers in, in 1A or 1B1. And uh, PrepMod accepted their uh, appointments and gave them appointments. And, and I tried this myself and was given an appointment on Friday, even though I don't qualify. I later canceled my appointment and our health authorities encouraged everyone who'd done so to, to do the same, to leave that appointment open for someone who needs it. My question is, is there some integration that needs to happen between PrepMod which sets the appointment, and phase finder, which tells you if you're eligible. Because you're answering essentially the same questions in prep mod as you are in phase finder, and yet prep mod allowed me, a person who didn't qualify, to sign up for a vaccine appointment. Um, is that a need that needs to be plugged? And are you seeing this elsewhere? Because our health authorities said, if you show up under these circumstances, we're going to have to turn you away. So is this, is this an exploit that's being taken advantage of uh, throughout the state, or has it been going on for some time? Yeah, no, great question. I, I wasn't aware of that. And, and, you know, we'll turn it to Michelle Lacey if they want to make a comment as well. But I will say that uh, two things. One, I'm glad, absolutely glad that uh, the the uh, local health authority did the right thing, which was to say, look, we, there is a prioritization plan. That plan is in there for a reason, right? This is not about, you know, people jumping the lines. Uh, this is about really we're trying to prevent uh, in a, as organized fashion in a very chaotic environment. Uh, we're trying to prevent uh, people who are most risk for uh, for severe illness or death, and we're trying to get those individuals vaccinated. So we absolutely do not want people to jump the line, and that is something we do not condone, and that is something that we have been very clear with our partners on the ground, and we will continue to reiterate. And if there is a community or a county that says, hey, we're, we're done with 1B1 and we, we've got excess vaccine, please let us know. Because guess what? We are more than happy uh, to find other partners around the state who are saying that they need vaccines. So we want to make sure that we can all move forward to the next tiers uh, together. Um, what I will also say is that, as I mentioned with the VAC Center, one of the things that, um, that we are uh, very interested in doing is to uh, is to streamline the processes for both 
uh, what's happening uh, from face finder and what's happening on the on the appointment side and really to to hopefully make those as integrated as possible there are some challenges uh, in doing so but this is where the vac center has has brought in uh, partners and we have been working hand in hand with Microsoft uh, with some of their appointment uh, uh, system um, um, tech, uh, technical um, uh, experts, if you will, uh, to really help hope uh, and help us get to the point where we have both better uh, communications, um, better uh, ways of of providing information, but also integrating and streamlining those technical issues, which right now are making it hard for everyone across the state of Washington. So we're not there yet. We certainly are are working to get there, but that's what the VAC Center is all about. So thanks for bringing that up. Michelle Lacey, did you have any, um, uh, either of you, any comments on on that specific issue at Wenatchee? And by the way, that is the one site that I have not had a chance to visit. And that's, that's also um, somewhere where I also want to go. Yeah, we're looking at, again, um, we're aware of what happened in Wenatchee, and I think it really just continues to show the absolute importance of how we're communicating and how easy it is to deliver a message that wasn't intended. Um, so all sites are in alignment with the phases, and you're right, we can continue to look for um, double checks in our tools to catch things that may be out of line, but we're also asking for an honor assist repair. There's a reason why the people who are in line who should be in line right now, and we really did that based on community input, um, the risk of death and hospitalization and who is most at risk, um, and what do we know about our own epi data and the guidance from the federal government. So it was a pretty um, robust process to determine who's in line, and we're asking all Washingtonians to wait their turn. Um, so there, there is a piece of how can our systems provide some double checks on that and that everybody does need to honor where we're at as a state and whose turn it is to be getting vaccinated. All right, thank you. This concludes the question and answer segment of our briefing. And now we'll go to Secretary Shaw for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frangie. Thank you to our media partners. Thank you to our community. And thank you to um, my colleagues that are on this uh, call. I just want to just remind everybody that we continue to uh, work as diligently as possible with our, our um, the challenges that are at hand, which include uh, trying to increase the numbers of Washingtonians that are vaccinated every single day, but also to make sure that we are not leaving people behind, that we, we do this in an equitable manner. So both this, um, these, these two key tenants, as I said, it's not an either or, it's an and, and we have to be really integrating and as complementary as we can to make sure those two things are happening. We want to continue to remind everybody to please be patient, do everything you can to work with us, both uh, uh, incredible gratitude to our partners on the ground, uh, incredible gratitude to our federal partners for working to, to try to give us uh, increased both supplies of vaccine again, but also more intel, intel on what's coming up ahead for, for a few weeks at a time rather than just a few days before. So we, we're making progress, significant progress. Uh, but at the same time, we have a, a, a lot of work still ahead of us and uh, we cannot do this alone. And so just want to continue to emphasize to people, please, we know that you may be tired of this virus. This virus is not tired of us. We've got to do everything we can to continue to fight this pandemic together. And with that, just an incredible amount of respect and gratitude. And just also a thank you to all the all the partners who hosted me this uh, last few days um, on uh, various communities uh, from Spokane uh, to uh, all the way to Yakima and in between, uh, I would just want to say thank you so much because it was an incredible opportunity to see parts of the state that uh, I was less familiar with. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And Frangie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, this concludes today's media availability. I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today and TVW for hosting today's live stream and archives of past briefings. Thank you all and take care.